we've already been talking a bit about this idea of trying to build robust models. And by this, we mean we want to uh, make choices that will allow our models, or at least the forms of the models that we're choosing to perform well in, in the future. We've already had some demonstrations uh, where a training procedure can dramatically overfit the training data that it is given. And when we're faced with this kind of a situation, uh, one of the first things that we would try is to add more training data. If, if we are indeed overfitting the available training data, then what we would expect as we add more data is that performance on an independent data set should increase uh, with that increase in the uh, amount of training data. Of course, that uh, performance will ultimately asymptote, at which point uh, we, we can stop adding that training data. Pulling out more training data is not always an option. And uh, another approach is to start to add certain kinds of uh, biases to the training process, such that we prefer certain kinds of solutions over uh, others. And in particular, we can introduce biases that try to uh, enable the models to generalize better uh, to the rest of the, the, the population of, of possible samples. We, we've already played with a few examples of these in the form of ridge regression, lasso, and elastic net. Uh, all of these preferred uh, model choices that involved very small coefficients. So, so each one of these is an example of us bringing in regularization in, in making our choices about what the parameters should be. And, and really the, the way to think about regularization is that it's a way of uh, expressing a, a trade-off between explaining the, the variances that exist in the training data and making models uh, smooth or, uh, or simple. Both lasso and ridge regression had a single parameter that allowed us to walk this line between, uh, between variance and bias. For elastic net, it also has a parameter for, for this bias variance trade-off, but within the bias side, uh, we also had a second, a second hyperparameter that allowed us to uh, talk about the form of the bias. And, and in particular, it allowed us to walk between the L1 and the L2 norm uh, in, uh, in, in selecting our coefficients. And we have lots of different kinds of models out there, and each one generally has a whole set of different hyperparameters that are possible. So, for example, if we're doing linear regression with polynomial pre-processing of the input features, then the degree of that polynomial is a hyperparameter. In the case of decision trees, and some of you know about those, uh, we'll talk about them in much more detail here in, in the next couple weeks. Uh, the, there are a whole range of different possibilities uh, for hyperparameters there. One is uh, restricting the maximum depth of a, a decision tree. Uh, another is, uh, another one restricts the, uh, the entropy uh, in, in the leaves uh, such that uh, we won't continue to expand a, a leaf if it uh, already has very low entropy. Uh, in both of those cases, we're, we're reducing the, the complexity of uh, the trees by, uh, by introducing these kinds of constraints. For those who dealt in deep networks, uh, and we won't, we won't cover those in class, but, uh, uh, but, but there's lots of uh, good material out there. Uh, the number of layers or the, uh, the size uh, of each layer in terms of the number of neurons, these are also uh, hyperparameters that, that one can adjust. Taking a step back, whenever we're faced with a new modeling problem, we really want to answer two questions. What's the best form or type of model that, that we should be using for this problem? And how do we select the hyperparameters for a given uh, model type? In making these two choices, we want to be confident in uh, as we move forward, that the resulting uh, choices will actually give us a quality model uh, in the future. And in particular, we want to be able to make a very uh, sound uh, decision uh, from a st statistical perspective. So one possible approach to 
uh, to solving this is, is that we first use cross-validation uh, to make hyperparameter choices for each model. And what that involves is uh, for, for each hyperparameter choice, we, we create a model, we measure performance with respect to our validation fold, and then we look at the population of the validation fold performances uh, and uh, compare, the, say, those means uh, across the different hyperparameter choices. This gives us a winning hyperparameter choice for a given model type. Uh, and then from there, we can go about comparing the different model types. And a possibility is to use this validation set performance again to compare uh, the, the different model types. The, the problem is uh, that we can actually uh, overfit uh, our choice of hyperparameters uh, such that uh, the, these choices don't actually uh, work well in the general case. So ju just as we can overfit uh, the parameters that are selected by a learning algorithm within the, within the model, this process uh, here can actually overfit the hyperparameters. So we want to be able to address uh, this kind of an issue. So, so the, the goal of this uh, set of videos is to get to a, uh, a larger uh, solution. I'm going to refer to it as the holistic cross-validation approach. Um, but before we get to that point, I want to talk about uh, the charlatan problem, which is uh, a statistical uh, uh, issue that comes up. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, making choices about hyperparameters and, and the things we have to worry about there. And then we'll bring all of those things together uh, as we design this holistic cross-validation approach. Uh, and finally, we'll, we'll talk about the, the statistical process for, for comparing our models.